today are Molly. Your speakers today are Molly, who is located at the Kansas Gardens and Giving Grove. Uh, and then there's me, Brittany, who is located in Nebraska, and I am the Gardens and Giving Grove Manager. Next. So today, some things that we will be covering are seed saving, pollinators and native plants, crop rotation, succession planting, cover crops, post-harvest handling and food safety, food storage, and food preservation. So to start, seed saving. What is seed saving? Seed saving is the practice of saving seeds or other reproductive material from vegetables, grain, herbs, and flowers for use from year to year for annuals and nuts, tree fruits, and berries for perennials and trees. So why is seed saving important? It allows you to produce high quality seeds and grow healthy plants without relying on outside sources. You can save money, grow and improve your favorite varieties and preserve heirloom seeds for future generations. So there are technically about two different kinds. You have your wet seed crops and your dry seeds. So wet seeded crops have seeds embedded in the flesh of fruits. So some examples are tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, melons, squashes, and cucumbers. Dry seeded crops have seeds enclosed in pods or husks. Uh, some vegetable examples are corn, rice, and wheat, beans, peas, and lentils, cabbage, mustard, and kale. Next. So different seed considerations. You might wanna look for heirloom, organic and open pollinated seeds. Hybrid seeds will not produce a next generation that is true to type. So avoid using seeds from hybrid plant varieties. You wanna avoid genetically modified seeds if you are seed saving. Some seed companies obtain a patent for developing this type of seed. So saving seed is technically considered infringement on their intellectual property. So it's really important to be reading your um, packages. Conventional seeds may be treated with fungicide or pesticide. However, it is not a hybrid variety. So it is possible to save. Uh, isolation is important when it comes to seed saving. Um, isolation is when you separate one plant from another to prevent crossing. You want to check the isolation distance and proper measure if you are growing two plant varieties that could cross pollinate. So it's always important to make sure that you are growing what you are sa saving in different either locations or just spaced out enough. So again, it is important to check your packaging. Next. So harvesting the seeds. You want to choose the biggest seeds from your plants as they are most mature and best for saving. Seeds embedded in the flesh of fruits and vegetables are usually collected in plastic buckets or bowls. Metal or plastic strainers work well too. Wet seeds will stick to paper so that material is not recommended. Seed pods are best collected in baskets, which allow better air circulation for further drying. Paper bags, onion sacks, and cardboard boxes can also be used. Next. All right, so the process. So we have dry process, which is used for plants that produce seeds in pods or husks, such as beans, peas, leeks, and radishes. You're gonna allow the pod to dry on the plant preferably and harvest them individually. <laughs> Another option is to pull out the whole plant when it's seed pods with its seed pods and hang the plant to dry. As the plant dies, the seed will continue to mature and gain strength. You can remove the seeds from their covering. It's a process called threshing. You put the seed pods in a burlap sack or pillowcase and shake it so the pods crack open for smaller seeds. Oh, sorry. For smaller seeds, crack open the pods and being careful, do not rub too hard, which can cause the seeds to split or break. The picture on the right is just a process you can use when you have larger cell sh shells or smaller shells. Uh, some of the um, little uh, shakers have uh, different sizes. So you wanna pay attention to what size you are using with which 
vegetable you were trying to dry and process. Next. So wet process, used for seeds found in the flesh of fruits or vegetables, such as musk melons, watermelons, squashes, and eggplants. So you're gonna cut open the fruit or vegetable and remove the seeds. You'll wash the seeds, place the seeds with pulp in a large bowl or bucket, add twice as much water as the seed and pulp mix, and stir. Good viable seeds are dense and will sink to the bottom. Poor quality seeds tend to float. Pour off the floating seeds and debris and add more water. Repeat the process until one clean, only clean seeds are left. Then pour them into a strainer and wash under running water. The next step is to dry the seeds. Wipe the bottom of the strainer to remove as much moisture as possible. Then we spread the seeds onto a glass or ceramic dish, cookie sheet, or a window screen. Do not dry on paper as the seeds may stick. It is important to dry seeds as quickly as possible because warm, wet seeds will start to germinate or become moldy. Stir the seeds several times to aerate. Damage can occur if the temperature of the seed rises above 96 degrees, so never dry seeds in the oven. Next. All right, so the fermentation process. It's similar to the wet process. It's used for seeds of fruits and vegetables such as melons, tomatoes, and cucumbers. On the right, you can kind of see a diagram of kind of how it's done. Um, you're going to remove the seeds and mix them with enough water to cover about an inch. It is fine if the seeds and water are mixed with some of the flesh of the fruit or vegetable. Allow the seeds to ferment for one to four days. When a layer of white or gray mold has formed on top of the water, this mold breaks down inhibitors to germination, such as the gel sac around the tomato seeds. The fermentation is complete. Add more water, swish it around, and pour off the mold and pulp. The viable seeds should sink to the bottom. Bad seeds will float. Uh, your last step is to set the seeds on a plate or screen to dry thoroughly. Next. All right, so storing your seeds. Some importance is you want to store them in the temperature between 35 and 40 degrees, and you want your humidity to be about 40%. So you just remember 40 degrees, 40% humidity. So storing your seeds. When your seeds are dry, they can be labeled and stored. Label the seed envelopes with the date, plant variety, and any other details you want to remember. It's best to store your seeds in an airtight container in a dark, cool place. Canning or mason jars work well as they are airtight and can store several envelopes together in a single sealed jar. A lot of people store them in refrigerators, but uh, if you're using them sooner than later, you can also leave them out. Um, but there's a diagram on the right to show just kind of how long you can preserve seeds to last. Here's an example of how to save lettuce seeds. So your lettuce seeds are easy to save using the dry process. Allow the lettuce plant to flower and wait for the flowers to die and go to seed. At this point, the flower heads will turn white and fluffy like a dandelion. If you pull out the white fluffy bits, the seed will be attached to the ends. Gently remove the white fluff from the seeds and put the clean seeds into an envelope for storage. And just remember to always label so you don't mix up your seeds. All right, pollinators and native plants. Pollinators have evolved with native plants, which are best adapted to the local growing season, climate, and soil. Native plants provide shelter and food for wildlife. They promote biodiversity and stewardship of our natural heritage. Native plants are beautiful and increase scenic value. So here are just a few examples of Nebraska and Kansas native plants. So some in Nebraska are white yarrow, false sunflower, fragrant sand verbena, blue phlox, anise hyssop, purple poppy mallow, clove currant, and lead plant. Some Kansas native plants are swamp milkweed, 
sunflower, early buttercup, Joe pie weed, hollyhock, buffalo gourd, spiderwort, and plains larkspur. So creating a native style garden. The most economical, economical way to start the garden is by seed. Seeds may take up to two years to fill in and produce a thick, full site. You want to sow seeds after frost when spring rains will help keep them hydrated. Keep the seedlings wet and maintain vigilance for weeds during the garden's establishment. Apply light mulch after sowing seeds to protect them from birds and wind as they germinate. So when selecting plants, you're going to want to select ones that will grow well in sun, shade, and soil type and moisture of your site. Prairies, prairies consist of 80% grasses and sedges and 20% wildflowers or forbs. You're going to want to include a mixture of warm and cool season grasses. So when caring for native style gardens, Caring for prairie gardens requires only moderate watering once established. Prairie gardens that dry out may catch fire in certain areas. For this reason, it is a good idea to provide a buffer of soil or sod between buildings and your home. Plants with a capacity for invasiveness need to have the seed heads removed at the end of the season. Leave the seed heads on the remaining plants for food or animals and allow them to self-sow. At the end of the season, mow the spent plants to the ground and leave the cuttings as mulch. The garden will re-sprout in spring and provide a fuller, more vibrant spray space with every successive year. You can mow or trim as well. All right, so what is crop rotation? Crop rotation is the practice of changing or switching the crops that are grown in a particular location, field, plot, or garden bed, every season. In other words, it's when a gardener makes effort to avoid growing the same vegetable in the same spot year after year. Crop rotation can be as simple as switching between two different crop families or developing a planned sequence of up to a dozen crops, allowing fields to follow go unplanted or utilizing cover crops between seasons can also be a part of crop rotation. So on the right, you just kind of see the different families, legumes, fruit, brassicas, and fruiting vegetables. So those, you can see in an example of like four beds, you're going to want to rotate those every single year, not planting the same family in the same spot year after year. Why crop rotation is important. Practicing crop rotation can naturally enhance soil fertility and reduce the demand for chemical fertilizer inputs. Harvest yields can be 10 to 25% greater when crop rotation is used. Crop rotation can also help break the cycle of pest disease and weeds, thereby decreasing the need for pesticides. The use of cover crops in crop rotation improves soil health while also minimizing soil erosion and runoff. Crop rotation increases overall biodiversity among the soil and farm. Below ground, microorganisms and other members of the soil food web naturally thrive with variety, as do the beneficial insects, pollinators, and wildlife above ground. Next. So here you can see, this is just a two year example, but they started with the top left legumes one year. The second year on the top left, they switched to root vegetables. You can see as it rotates the spot every single year. So it's very important when it comes to crop rotation is the tracking, because you want to make sure that you are not planting the same family in the same spot year after year. So how to keep track of crop rotation. The most difficult part of practicing crop rotation can be keeping track. You can use a planner, spreadsheet, or chart to keep track of what you're growing in each bed every season. As growing seasons go on, you can look back at previous years and plan ahead for the future. Great stuff. All right. Succession planting. Succession, 
succession planting refers to several planting methods that increase crop availability during a grows, growing season by making efficient use of space and timing. Succession planting is most important for determinate crops, which are crops that produce all their fruit or edible material at once. Indeterminate plants will continue to produce fruit off the same plant, so you don't need to worry about succession planting with them. Some advantages of succession, succession planting would be it maximizes your space, it extends the harvest window, you maintain a continuous supply, and optimize quality and yield. Some disadvantages would be the overtaxing soil, not giving the soil a chance to rest or replenish nutrients. Next. Here we just kind of have an example of how um, starting with a seed, thinking about the days it takes for it to mature, and then here you can break down the process of your planting. So we'll use an example of bush beans. You have 50 days of maturity. So it's about 14 days between each planting. So you'll start your first plant um, on this graph. It says 421.15. So you start with 421 and then plant your second round by um, 14 days later and then 14, 14, 14 until your plant is over. This helps extend your growth season of vegetables. So you have um, the same vegetable for longer, but also it helps with tackling pests. Let's say if you start like this one on 421.15 and pests come and wipe it out, you could try again on your second round. Or let's say your first one's fine, it's growing, and by the second planting, a pest wipes out your second round of vegetables, you still have your first and you can go again on your third. So it's important to break down the days with your total days of maturity. All right, so these are just some different examples. So same vegetable, staggered plantings. Space out plantings of the same vegetable every two to four weeks. Many vegetables fade after producing their initial crop. Paired vegetables in the same spot. Often you can see the early season vegetable at the same time you were planting. Intercropping or pairing up plants is an excellent way to squeeze even more productivity from your garden. Companion planting is another way to utilize succession planting. Different vegetables in succession. Some crops, such as peas, have short growing seasons and the space they are using can be replanted with a later season crop, like eggplants. The best vegetables for succession planting are arugula, basil, beans, whole, whole beans, beets, broccoli, carrots, chicory, cilantro, corn, dill, endive, green onions, kale, kohlrabi, lettuce, mizuna, mustard, bok choy, radish, rutabaga, spinach, Swiss chard, tot soy, and turnips. So some tips when it comes to succession planting. Some crops such as potatoes, tomatoes, and squash you will only plant once. Fast maturing crops such as leafy greens, annual herbs, and some root crops are the easiest to keep in production with succession planting. Crops planted from seedlings will mature faster than the same crop planted from seed. Add some compost or leaf mold to the beds between plantings to keep the soil rich. Don't hesitate to pull vegetables past their prime. Use them while they are at their best and use, and then use the space for something else. It is important to utilize varieties that with, can withstand lower temperatures and possible frost in the beginning and the end of your seasons. At the start of summer, utilize varieties that are heat tolerant to minimize bolting and bitterness of leafy, leafy crops. Fall and winter crops, such as Brussels sprouts and cabbage, are best planted in late June, early July from seed, or in July and August from starts, seedlings.
Right. So here are just some examples um, of different plants you could use in different seasons. So suggested spring plantings from March to April would be collard. You could start that. Uh, carrots from seed, cauliflower from seedling, cabbage from seedling, broccoli from seedling, beets can be started from seeds. Asian greens can be started from seeds uh, and radishes from seeds. Suggested late spring to mid summer, which would be May to July. Could be basil from seeds or um, seedlings. Beads, bush beans from seed. Beets from seeds. Cilantro from seeds. Rutabaga from seeds. Turnips from seeds. Suggested late summer to early fall plantings would be July to September. Uh, you could start arugula from seeds, different Asian greens from seeds, broccoli from seeds or seedlings, um, Brussels sprouts from seeds or seedlings, collards from seeds or seedlings, um, spinach from seeds or seedlings. All right, so cover crops. Cover crops are plants that are planted to cover the soil rather than for the purpose of being harvested. Cover crops manage soil erosion, soil fertility, soil quality, water, weeds, pests, diseases, biodiversity, and wildlife in an agroecosystem and ecological system managed and shaped by humans. So different examples of cover crops, which there are tons more, but um, some include mustard, alfalfa, rye, clovers, buckwheat, cowpeas, could be field peas, uh, oats, radishes, and hairy vetch. So different advantages and disadvantages of using cover crops. Advantages, reduces soil erosion, increases residue cover increased water infiltration, increased soil organic carbon, improved soil physical properties and reduced soil compaction, recycle nutrients so it can fix nitrogen with legumes, improve weed control, it's beneficial to insects and disease suppression, wildlife habitat and landscape aesthetic as well. So disadvantages. Planted when time and labor is limited, may increase insect pests, reduced or increased soil moisture effects depending on weather or management, difficult to incorporate cover crops with tillage, and may increase disease risk. Next. So here's just an example of like corn without cover crops and corn with cover crops. So without, it is limited coverage above and below topsoil. Uh, you can see like the CO2 above and the carbon below. So corn with cover crops, there's more coverage above and below the topsoil, extensive root systems that aid in water infiltration, aids in carbon sequestering, sequestration, and fixes nitrogen. It also reduces soil erosion, keeps nutrients in place, and helps suppress weeds. Next. Great, so how cover crops kind of works is you would sprinkle it in the fall where it's going to grow, some in the fall and over winter, and then in the spring it might grow again. So when you are ready to plant, what you can do, your options are tilling with it to where it goes, all the nutrients are kind of tilled and it just goes in the soil. Or if you are in a no-till farming, there is a uh, uten there is a utensil or tool <laughs> called um, a roller crimper. And you're going to use that to break the cover crop. It just kind of snaps it or smushes it. And it's flattened kind of like a mulch. It's called green manure. And you just kind of leave it on the soil surface. And this way you can um, plant within uh, the cover. All right, so cover crop effects on soil and water. Cover crops are grown when the soil is fallow. 
increase the solar energy harvest and increase carbon in the soil, provides food for macro and microorganisms organisms and other wildlife, reduce sediment production, decrease impacts of raindrops and decrease runoff velocity. Uh, cover crops grow best in warm, moist areas, but may hurt yields in semi-arid regions. Soil temperatures may impact yields. Systems are needed that reduce the cost of cover crop establishment and killing. Cover crops improve soil and water quality, may reduce nutrient and pesticide runoff by 50% or more, decrease soil erosion by 90%, reduce sediment loading by 75% and reduce pathogen loading by 60%. Next. So I thought this was kind of cool. It just gives you uh, a picture of the root system of cover crops. So I'll just let y'all look, but you can kind of see which cover crops have larger root systems. And it looks like sunflower and oil radish are about the longest one, and red clover. All right, so the diagram on the left kind of just shows the cover crops for your small farm. You have winter and cereal rye, which you plant in fall or early winter, buckwheat, which grows very quickly, clover there's different varieties for all different purposes sorghum has extensive root structure and hairy vetch which is normally perfect for northern climates uh, cover crop seeds kind of estimate between 10 and 50 dollars it just varies on what you are using um, you can buy most cover crop from any farm store nursery or garden garden center it's kind of hard to find it in like a walmart or home depot uh, lots of places offer cover crop mixes or singular varieties all right thank you so much hello everyone i'm molly i work at the big garden and i am going to do the next portion of the presentation and I'm gonna cover post-harvest handling. Um, so this is essentially once you harvest your food from your garden or your farm, uh, how do we handle it, store it, and some food safety tips. And then also I'm gonna go over some food preservation techniques. Okay, so post-harvest handling, let's talk about our produce. Well, um, our actually, when we harvest our tomatoes and our peppers and all that, it's actually still alive. Our produce is still alive. It still breathes. It still releases heat. Um, it does lose moisture. It can get sick and it can even die. So when we um, harvest our when we harvest our vegetables, they are still respiring. So if you remember from your high school science class when you were learning about photosynthesis and respiration, I'll do a quick overview. So our plants go through the photosynthesis process within the cells and they produce C6H12O6, which is essentially sugar plus oxygen. And they use that to then go through the respiration process. So the plant can then use that sugar and they release carbon dioxide, water and energy in the form of heat. So some factors to think about is some vegetables respire at a higher rate than others. So as you can see on the X, Y axis, um, the perishability as well as the uh, respiration rate. So on the bottom, you can see cabbage, romaine hearts, they have pretty low respiration rate and therefore they have a very long storage life. And as you go up um, the chart, the respiration increases, which then also causes the perishability to increase. To the top where we get our greens, strawberries, those tend to have a shorter shelf life. Oh. Okay. So what are some factors that influence post-harvest loss? Well, we have environmental factors and we have some internal factors. So 
environmental factors include changes in temperatures, physical damage to the produce, um, pathogens, humidity, rodents, and contamination. Um, internal factors are such respiration, which is the metabolic rate, compositional changes, which we'll talk about in a little bit, morphological changes, physiological changes, and general senescence. And senescence is a fancy word of saying dying. It's essentially the plant is dying. So let's talk about temperature control. So temperature is one of the most important factors that influence post-harvest life of our produce. Um, temperature dictates the speed at which the chemical reactions such as respiration occur. So typically for every 18 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius, um, you'll have an increase in respiration two to four fold. So as the temperature increases, the produce will respire at a higher rate. So removing the produce from the field or from the garden as soon as possible is really important. And there's lots of ways you can cool down your produce quickly. You can do air cooling, such as refrigerators or freezers. You can do hydro cooling, which is just a bucket of cold water out in the garden. So when you're harvesting your peppers and things like that, you just stick it into a bucket of cold water and that will quickly cool down your produce. Or you can do ice cooling, which is a very common um, technique for broccoli growers, where essentially they harvest the broccoli and then they cover it up with a top layer of ice to cool it down quickly. So water loss also can really affect the quality of your produce. It can decrease the quality in terms of wilting and shriveling, as you can see in this picture. Um, it will lose its crispness and juiciness. And also nutritional quality can go down because some of our vitamins, such as vitamin A and vitamin C, are water soluble. So when the vegetables or fruits are losing water, they're actually losing some of that vitamin and nutritional content as well. So ways to improve the overall quality and reduce water loss is to control your humidity. In your refrigerator, you actually have your crisp zones for your drawers and you can control the humidity. You essentially want high humidity um, to keep that water loss at a minimum, but you don't want to have the vegetables or fruits standing or sitting in any water. Um, you want to lower the temperature, you want to reduce any air movement, and you can also use some protective packaging. So physical damage, um, this happens a lot in agricultural um, systems. Things like bruising, puncturing, or pests can cause some damage to our vegetables and fruits, and this is the greatest amount of food loss in our food system. It can affect water loss. It can increase respiration, ripening, ethylene production. It can increase pathogen growth um, at the point of entry. So at that bruise, it can be an entry point for pathogens to come in and um, infect your fruits or vegetables. It can cause tissue discoloration and a reduction in quality. So pathological decay, so pathogens such as fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Most post-harvest infections are due to breaks in the skin of your produce or poor hygiene practices. Um, let's talk about some potential ways our food can get contaminated. Now, this doesn't really talk about meats because that's a whole different story. This is more about fruits and vegetables like in the field or in the garden. So your soil. Um, in the field or in your garden, you might have critters crawling through your garden. You might have dogs, raccoons, bunnies, you name it, and they might be putting some droppings or urinating on your produce, and that can be a form of contamination. Contaminated water. If you live in the city and you have city water that's been sanitized, this isn't as much of an issue, but if you're um, irrigating your garden or field with a farm pond, for example, you might have animals who are drinking from that water and defecating in the water and that can contaminate the water. Um, contaminated tools and equipment. And lastly, poor hygiene um, from who's, whomever is in the garden with unwashed hands or perhaps a unsanitized uh, cleaning station. So here are some harvest and food safety tips to think about when you're 
um, cleaning your produce and taking care of your produce, what are some things that we can do to keep it safe? Well, one thing is, is to pick your produce early in the morning um, and also harvest your produce at proper maturity. When you're harvesting, wash your hands and the equipment before you start and use clean, sharp tools. To sanitize your equipment or your tools, you can use isopropyl alcohol or a chlorine solution. You just dilute that with water. Um, to when you're um, when you're gathering your produce, you want to use containers that you can clean. A lot of farmers they'll use plastic tubs, something that you can clean and sanitize. If you're using wicker baskets, those are harder to clean. I know a lot of people use those, but maybe think about using something that you can wash off and sanitize. And you don't wanna overfill your buckets because if you're doing layers upon layers of your tomatoes, that can cause bruising. When you're harvesting, do that gently to minimize any damage to your produce. Um, discard any damaged or contaminated produce and also provide some shade in your garden if possible. You wanna get the, um, you wanna lower the temperature as quickly as you can. So perhaps once you've um, picked your tomatoes, try to get it in a shady spot and then try to cool it down as quickly as you can. Okay, where to properly store your food? Um, a lot of our foods you can actually store on our countertop because our, our home are typically between, I would say 65 to 75, I'd say average home would be 68 to 70 degrees, and you can store your tomatoes and squash at that temperature, um, bananas, peaches, nectarines, and plums. And also, if you have eggs, you can actually store your eggs um, on the counter. Um, in a cool, dark location, such as a root cellar or basement, you can store your canned goods, pasta, and dry goods, such as wheat and sugar, potatoes, onions, and garlic and winter squash, such as butter corn, butternut and acorn. And then the refrigerator is where you're storing your produce um, on that chart with the respiration rate. The produce that has high respiration and high perishability, that's where you're storing in the refrigerator. So that would be lettuce, spinach, herbs, and also cool season um, vegetables such as broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, they like the cooler temperatures as well as grapes, green onions, carrots. Those are all just, I mean, that the list is longer than this. This is just a few examples. Okay, on this chart or on this um, table, you can see our carrots and cabbage, they like it cooler. They like the almost freezing temperatures. They like it cold and humid with a high humidity, relative humidity. Um, onions and garlic, they like it cold and dry. So around freezing temperatures, but just a lower humidity. Potatoes, they like it cool and humid. I always keep those in my basement. A lot of times, sometimes our basements are kind of wet and humid as well. So that is nice to keep vegetables in that environment. Um, sweet potatoes are different than potatoes. So if, if you're not sure, sweet potatoes are actually a different family. Sweet potatoes come from the morning glory family and they're different. They're a completely different plant family than potatoes. So the way you store them are actually different than just regular potatoes. You can store them in warm, humid environments around 60 degrees at 90% humidity. And squash, you can keep in a warm and dry environment. Okay, here are just a few examples of the ideal conditions on how to store your, your produce. Um, a lot of our fruits like a little bit warmer. Tomatoes, they like it a little bit warmer and high humidity. So you can see 90 to 95%, that's fairly humid. Um, our vegetables, especially our cool season vegetables, they like it around freezing um, with high humidity. So almost all of our vegetables like high humidity and that's to prevent water loss. Okay, curing for long-term storage. So this is um, garlic potatoes, onions, things that, sweet potatoes, things that you want to store for a long time, maybe six months up to a year. Um, with potatoes, you, again, you can store those in your basement at high humidity. Um, and that helps with sealing the outer skin of that potato, sealing any nicks that maybe happened when you were harvesting the potatoes, trying to get those sealed 
and that will improve the quality for long-term storage. Now, I'm actually in the process right now in my garden of curing my onions. So I thought maybe I would go over into detail on how to cure onions. And pretty soon I'm gonna be harvesting my potatoes and I'll be doing this with my potatoes as well. But if you're curious on how to cure onions, um, the best ideal place is to find a warm, dry, shady place. So I don't cure my onions outside. Some people do, but it would need to be in a shady location. You do not want your onions to be in a full sun environment because what will happen is those onions will start to green. And once they start to green, it releases a toxin and it essentially be, makes them inedible. So you wanna get them out of direct sun, but they like it kind of warm. Um, you can hang them upside down. I've seen a lot of people do that, or you can lay it on a single file on a table. Um, you want to just have a location that has good aeration and that will allow the outer skin to dry and the leafy tops to become brown and brittle. This takes quite a while. It takes approximately two to three weeks before it completely dies back. Um, at that point, you can cut off right above the bulb. And if there's any green left that's part of the, the leaves or the, you know, the stem, if there's any green left, allow that to completely dry. Remove the roots and store in a wood crate or any kind of container that has good air circulation. Um, that's really important because if you stack them and there's no air circulation, the vegetables on the bottom are going to end up rotting. Or sometimes if there's light, they might end up starting to send up shoots. Um, it just will reduce the overall quality. So you want to find a dark, cool place with good air circulation and that will, <coughs> that will, um, will increase your overall long-term storage. Okay, let's talk about food preservation. I love talking about this because I have a big garden and it's always a bit overwhelming when all of a sudden your tomatoes come in all at the same time and you're swimming in tomatoes and you're, it's, um, what is it they call it? The, um, Oh, I forget. But essentially, it's the, it's the blessing of, of overabundance. So we need to find ways to preserve it. So let's talk about ways we can preserve it. Um, fermentation has been, that's been done for thousands of years. Um, pickling, curing and salt or sugar, drying your produce, canning, which includes jams and jellies, freezing refrigerators, obviously, which is a bit of a newer um, invention, freeze drying, which typically in the past that's never been available for the home gardener, but lately there's this new product called Harvest Right where they sell to the home gardener a freeze dryer. Um, and then vacuum sealing, which is like food saver. Um, you also can buy dry goods in airtight buckets and seal that up or glass jars. You can um, do a vacuum seal and that can preserve your food for quite a while. Okay, canning. I love canning. So the process of canning is hermetically sealing a glass jar to control food spoilage for long-term storage. So all of our food has bacteria, yeast, and mold on it all the time. But when it's sealed over long periods of time, it will give, that will start to grow and can spoil our food. So one way to control food spoilage is to expose those microorganisms to heat and then seal that heated food. And then we remove the oxygen and create an acidic environment that will help prevent microbial growth, such as botulism. Okay, when we talk about food preservation, I think it's important for us to know what are some things that can make us sick when we're preserving our food. Um, salmonella is a very common foodborne illness um, that is destroyed when it's held at the temperature of 140 to 165. So when you're cooking your meats, typically if you use a meat thermometer, you want it to be around the temperature of like 160. And that's because if it sustains at that temperature, uh, salmonella can't live in that environment and it will be destroyed. Um, the temperature of 140 to 179 most molds and yeasts are killed within this temperature, but some can still survive. Um, some of them are really tricky, but most of them are killed at that temp. Um, at 180 to 212,
that temperature, mold, yeast, and some bacteria are destroyed and high acid foods, which I'll talk about in a minute, what are high acid foods. And then 240, <coughs> excuse me, 240 is the temperature at which bacterial spores are destroyed in low acid foods, which I'll talk about in a minute what a low acid food is. So staphylococcus or staph and botulism must be heated to 100, or sorry, 240 degrees Fahrenheit in order to be destroyed because they have toxic producing spores in low acid foods. So once it gets to 240, those are killed. There's a lot of science behind canning, which I love, and knowing what temperature you need to um, get your, your meats and your vegetables at to help keep your food safe. But if you ever get it wrong, you'll know because when you open up, you can, and if it just an odor hits you in the face, and also if it looks a bit discolored, you know that the food has gone bad and you just need to throw it away. Okay, so there's two types of canning. There's water bath canning and pressure canning. So water bath canning is used for high acid foods. So if you remember from our science class, we learned the pH scale. Um, the lower the pH, the more acidic it is, and the higher the pH, the more alkaline it is. So high acidic foods are anything 4.6 pH or lower. And for the pressure canner, you use that for low acid foods, which means it has a higher pH, and that's a 4.6 or higher. And water bath canning is great for high acid foods such as fruits, and um, which I'll talk about in a second, like all the examples of that. And then pressure canning is great for our vegetables and meats, poultry and fish. Okay, here's our scale that we like to use as kind of our dividing line. On the left, you use a water bath canner, and then on the right, you use a pressure canner. So again, on the left is our high acid foods. So all of our fruits, such as apples, berries, cherries, um, any pickled vegetables, barbecue sauces, condiments, salsas. Also, if you make pizza sauce, anything like that, yogurts, vinegars. And right around between the pH of four and five, it's about your dividing line where it's not really low acid and it's not really high acid. Is there a question? Let me check. Oh, we'll get to your question in, at the end. Is that okay about the walking onions? Okay, we'll get to your end. Uh, remind me if I forget. Um, okay, so between a pH of four and a pH of five is right where your tomatoes, pineapples, bananas, they all kind of are right, right there. So you can make tomatoes more acidic and therefore you can water bath can. Um, but if you add tomatoes and then you add peppers and you add onions and you add other things that can also increase your pH and then you might need a pressure can. So I would recommend getting a really good canning book and follow their recipes closely and try not to deviate them from them too much because there's science behind the recipes as to what the pH is. Um, pH for our vegetables such as beans, beets, carrots, cucumbers, those are a higher pH. And again, if you're canning those, you need to use a pressure canner, as well as meats, poultry, milk. Okay, so what with water bath canning, you don't need a special pot. You can buy a special pot if you like, but it's not necessary. You can really use anything where the jars are completely covered with water. And you're processing that water to 212 degrees, which is the boiling point, to sufficiently kill mold, yeast, and some bacteria and high acid foods. And like I said, you can use this for your jams, your jellies, your fruit spreads. If you're making pickles or any fermented foods, salsa, relishes, tomato sauce, pizza sauce. Okay, pressure canning, this is to heat process heat process non-acidified foods such as vegetables, meats, and poultry. 
Um, and that's because low acid foods don't have enough acid to control bacterial growth. And pressure canners are available in most cooking supply stores. They do work on pretty much all um, stoves, including gas, electric, and glass top stoves. So I at home personally have a glass top stove, but I was told by um, someone from Extension that I wasn't able to use my pressure canner because it's glass top. So I was always pretty discouraged because I didn't think it was possible for me. But then when I did some more reading, I found out that you actually can use glass top stoves but you can't have the bottom of your pressure canner outside of where the heat is. Um, as long as the, you know, the heating element on your glass top stove is the same size or bigger as the bottom of your pot, you can use it. If your pot's bigger, it could crack the glass. So I just thought maybe I'd share that because I didn't pressure can for a long time because I didn't think I could. Um, and so your pressure canner should get up to 240 degrees to kill the botulism and some of those um, nasty bacteria. And you can use this for canned green beans, um, any like black beans, uh, pinto beans, potatoes, canned chicken or fish. Also one thing to think about is your altitude. Um, that actually will affect how long you process your food in your water bath or pressure canner. So the altitude of Kansas City, I have Topeka, Omaha, and Wichita here. Just to kind of give a variety, but they're all just about a little bit above a thousand feet. So with a water bath um, canning, if you have an altitude between 1,000 and 3,000 feet, you actually need to process five minutes more than what the recipe might say. Because if you read a canning book and it says you need to process it for 10 minutes, um, they're assuming that you are at an altitude of less than a thousand. So anything a thousand or above, um, so a thousand or three thousand, you need to add five minutes to that processing time. And then with pressure canning, you need to know what your altitude is to know what your weighted gauge and your dial gauge should be set at. So this is a good kind of, if you're wanting to dabble into canning, it's good to know this. So I thought I would include it. Some special equipment needed, um, besides your canners, obviously, you need some good mason jars. You can use regular mouth or wide mouth, and they come in half pint, three quarter pint, pint, quart, and gallon size. Um, I've used different brands of jars, and I think the preferred brand is Ball and Kerr. Um, those tend to not crack. They, they're the most durable, they're easy to clean. I just, in my opinion, I think they're the best. So I would say if you're looking uh, for jars, try to go either ball or cur. And canning jars right now are pricey. Ever since the pandemic, more and more people have gotten into canning and therefore the price of jars have gone up. So I would encourage you to maybe go to thrift stores or estate sales or things like that because usually you can get um, a big quantity for a much cheaper price. And then lids and bands. When you're... Um, Buying lids, um, I would recommend don't use any used lids. Make sure they're brand new. And once you can with those lids once, you can't reuse them again. And that's because it has this rubber seal on the lid. And once it's been used, it's essentially compromised and you can't use it again with canning. Now you can use it if you're just going to close something up and put it in the refrigerator, like you're not using it as a water bath or pressure canner lid, you know, like that to seal. Um, it's fine, but if you're wanting to can with it in a water bath or pressure canner, you can't use used lids. You have to use brand new. Um, canning funnel, that's just helps with keeping the mess down, even though it already is pretty messy when you're canning. Um, a jar lifter that helps lift the jars out of your boiling water bath. Um, the lid wand with a magnetic tip that helps pick up the lids and put it on your hot jar. That little magnetic tip will pick it up and help put it on the jar. It's really a nice, handy tool. Um, a tool to measure headspace. When you're making jams, for example, they always want a specific headspace between the level of where your jam is and the top of the jar. And that's because when you're when you put that in a water bath, you want to have some headspace to allow the gases and steam to release. <coughs> but it has to be a very specific amount, otherwise it won't can properly. 
Um, you'll need a spatula to remove any air bubbles. Um, once you've filled your jar, like with jam, you want to make sure there's no air bubbles. You need to, like you need a spatula that's kind of narrow that you can um, stick inside your jar and kind of remove any of the bubbles. And then any labels to label your jars. Okay, drying. I love drying my produce. It's a really um, inexpensive. You don't need very much equipment. A lot of people can do it now without having to buy anything because they probably have an oven or you can just leave something out in the sun. So there's um, lots of ways you can dry your produce. You can hang it upside down or a well ventilated rack with good airflow and low humidity. This is ideal for herbs and flowers. Um, I love doing that. You can also stick it out in the direct sun, but I recommend covering it with cheesecloth or something to keep the insects off. And this is an ancient technique with sun-dried tomatoes or chili peppers. They used to dry those out in the direct sun. Or you can go the route of buying something like a dehydrator or your oven at home um, that will heat up the produce and remove moisture. This is great for creating like fruit leather or drying any veggies, um, tomatoes, meats, herbs. And then freeze dryers, which essentially it freezes it. It does like a flash freeze and it freezes it really quickly. And then it removes moisture up to 99%. And this has an incredibly long shelf life, these freeze, the freeze dried food. Um, and you can do that with fruits and herbs and spices and all kinds of things. Pickling, this is a very easy way to preserve vegetables with very few ingredients or equipment needed. Um, Essentially what you do is you create a vinegar brine to create an acidic environment. And recipes are usually fairly straightforward. It's a different measurements of vinegar, salt, sugar, and spices. And you can preserve um, your pickled vegetables for months in the refrigerator, or you can then water bath can it. Um, so it's a high acidic environment. You can water bath that for up to one year. And this is great for cucumbers, obviously. But garlic scapes are really cool, which is when you're growing garlic, it, sheds, it, it sends out this little flower scape, they call it. And those are so delicious. It's like a mild garlicky flavor. So good as pickled. You can pickle onions and put those on your burgers, asparagus, green beans, beets, and jalapenos. And then fermentation also has been going on for thousands of years. And that's a way to preserve your food in a salt brine. So over time, you know, our food has yeast and good bacteria on it and it will create um, lactic acid. And about for about one week, then it will start to bubble and release gases. Um, to create some great ferments, let the ferment sit on the countertop, which is approximately 68 degrees Fahrenheit for five to seven days. And then after that point, the fermentation process has begun. And then you can put that ferments down in your basement or cold cellar for about another two to three weeks to finish. Um, they will start to get a bit smelly. They release gases. And so every once in a while, they, you, you'll want to burp it. Essentially, you want to release the lid and let some of those gases escape. You, I've heard some horror stories of people not doing that and then their jar actually explodes because it builds up, the gases build up and then it actually explodes. Um, so you wanna burp it every so often to release some of those gases. And it can get a bit stinky, but after a while the smell will kind of simmer down and um, in about two to four weeks, the fermentation should be complete. Um, you want to make sure that your food is completely covered in that brine the whole time during the fermentation process. Um, if any of the food is up above that uh, line, mold and botulism can grow. And if you notice a mold layer on the top, you have to throw it out because it's not safe to eat at that point. Um, but I love fermented foods. Um, some examples are sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, kombucha. Miso yo yogurt, um, root vegetables, garlic, just so many yummy things. Okay, so benefits of fermented food. Um, the enzymes that release um, actually boost the nutrition of your foods. Um, you have really good 
um, bacteria, your probiotics. They're really good for your gut and your digestive health. Also, the lactic acid that is created during the fermentation process can actually help kill E. coli and make it safer than fresh food. And also, it's a great preservative, and it can boost nutrition. Okay, that covers it. Um, I think we will...